Alright, hey guys and welcome back. Uh, I've been away for a little bit, my mic's been broken, and uh, today I'm just starting to record. I don't know if you can hear this in the background, it's raining really hard and uh, you might hear some thunder at some points. I'll try and use noise removal to get most of that out, but unfortunately I don't think I'll be able to get all of it out. Uh, I did move my birds in the other room like I've been doing recently, more. I used to do during recording and I'm going to continue doing recording. So um, we're going to go ahead and launch right into this. Um, I will make another update video about uh, all this at some point. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to do our first episode, I guess, of the Blender LP. Um, people have been asking me this since I posted a video on my channel. This is fairly recent, at least when this video is going up. Is uh, called Constellations. And if you haven't seen it, I'll put a link in the description. But you can go watch that. It's uh, really good, I, in my opinion at least. I, I really enjoyed making it. And... Um, I think it looks pretty good. It's not perfect. Um, the entire video is actually just art artistic little thing I made, designed one to help me, you know, a new project to kind of uh, learn how to use camera stuff a little bit better in Blender. Uh, but mainly, it's meant to show off the constellation add-on that I found on the Blender Artist thread the other day. And let me tell you, that add-on is something else. It allowed me to create this pretty much this entire animation. I used a few other modifiers and a little bit of special effects. Other than that, pretty much the thing that really makes this animation is the Constellation add-on. I'm not going to be showing that off today, but I will show you the finished product. And once again, you can go look at the video. Um, sorry, that just happened. Uh, I'm just going to ignore that. Uh, it, it happens occasionally on this computer while I'm recording. Don't know why. But anyway, so we're going to go ahead and get straight into this Blender LP. And once again, I'm sorry if you can hear the rain in the background. I will try and remove that. So you can see here, here is the uh, little dots that um, if we go ahead and watch, the animation kind of comes up like this and there's all sorts of stuff. And we can actually go into the cameras. And what I'm going to talk about before I talk about any of how this mechanic works in this uh, Constellations blend, I'm going to talk about this and this layer. Um, I tried to organize these and name everything in here and this project is all uh, really well organized actually. I think that a lot of people that maybe necessarily would get this blend file if I hadn't explained it to them would still be able to understand at least most of this because I've labeled everything fairly clearly. So I'm gonna get, go ahead and talk about, in this uh, Blender LP, I'm gonna talk about uh, some different techniques I've used that uh, you all may or may not be familiar with from my videos or maybe I haven't even talked about them at all. I'm gonna talk about how I did a lot of the camera stuff here first. So what you can see here is there's a ton of cameras here. There is actually in total 16, I believe, or 15, I'm not quite sure, I can't remember. But um, 16 of these make it all up. And now if we press Alt A right now, you'll see that these cameras will actually switch without me having to switch them. And um, this is a technique that I've talked about, I believe, on my channel called uh, binding cameras to markers. And you see I have these markers down here. If you look really closely, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see. Uh, cam 4, Cam 5, Cam 6. So as it goes, um, each camera um, will switch. And you'll see this black arrow and see will switch to another one. Uh, it's one of these over here. I don't remember which one it is. Uh, I can't see it. I don't know, it's one of these cameras though. Oh, this one right here. And um, and uh, it switches based on where the marker is and you can bind it. And that one is really helpful because then I have to you know, have a camera panning here and then move it to another one. It also means I can reuse cameras. So for instance, this camera right here, just literally the entire animation does this particular circle around the, uh, um, around the model. And I can switch back to that camera whenever I think it's gonna be a good shot or whenever I need some filler shots in between another shot of mine. And uh, so that is really cool. And I will talk about that in a minute. But you can see here, a lot of these have things like cam focus, and these are empties here right now. So this one is cam focus, and usually there is, um, there's either one to up to three um, empties per camera. I have three main different types of empties, and I've also made them look different depending on what they are. For instance, the rotate ones are, um, are spheres, the focuses are cubes, and I believe the, uh, there are zoom ones or pan ones as well, and those are cones. But you can see here, so this these ones all rotate like there. This one doesn't uh, rotate at the moment particularly. But you can see here, if we start over at cam 10, you can see it begin to rotate here. And it actually rotates on a linear scale. So it maintains a constant amount of rotation. But yeah, the uh, the cameras are parented to their rotates. Um, and then the focuses are parented to the cameras. And the focuses, that way we can you know change the focus mid shift. All of these cameras use the, um, they use variable apertures, but they all use, uh, I do radius because I don't, uh, the f-stop uh, is the actual realistic value that a lot of photographers are going to use, but I find that f-stop in cycles is not the same as real world f-stop. Oh, sorry, that was thunder. Uh, or it, the f-stop is a little bit different um, interpreted in cycles, and I don't know whether that's just me not understanding it. I do do a lot of camera stuff, so you think I would know, but I don't know. Anyways, I, I mainly use radius sizes, and I usually go for something between 0.1 and 0 0.025. And then I used, uh, for just this particular animation, eight blades. You can't really see it. 
And um, yeah, that's the basic camera setup. Uh, all of them, you know, you can see here, it is quite a mess when you put them all together, but I have them all on separate layers. So here's the camera layer, here's all the empty layers. And, um, and yeah, it kind of works from there. And you can see, you know, some of these go in like that. Um, then if we go over here, we can see now, uh, here is just the dots layer. And this is actually, I believe, um, yeah. So this is a point cloud, a mesh cloud that I made from the mesh that I originally constructed my constellation from. And if that's a bit confusing, I'm sorry, I might be going a little fast. I'll try and slow down and explain that in a minute. But basically this is just a cloud of a bunch of vertices. And um, I have a single object in here that is actually parented to this object here. And then it has uh, the dupla, dupla vertices on here. Um, and I didn't do rotation because I didn't really need that. Then over here, I have uh, what looks like a blank layer right now. And if we go ahead and skip over, you'll see it build itself. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar, this is actually using the build modifier after my constellation mesh. So if we go ahead and press tab in here, you can actually see that this is a path mesh. And this is not what the constellation mesh add-on does. I did this myself. The constellation mesh merely makes a um, edges connect between vertices. Um, it's really cool, and I will do a demo on it later um, a, at some point, probably uh, when I'm in college, so don't expect anything anytime soon, but I might do it earlier if I have time. And so you can see here it slowly builds itself, um, and that's just using the build uh, modifier and also a subsurf modifier. Now, this subsurf modifier is here for really one reason one reason only. If I turn it off, you know, you can't really see much of a difference here because this is all stuff like this, but the um, the way this this is getting its thickness is actually through a extrusion of a bezler circle, which is turned down to its lowest resolution. So it's actually a square when it's extruded. And then this subsurf gives it more, um, if we go ahead and press Z here and we turn this up, you'll see that suddenly there are a lot more lines here. If we turn it off it now, you'll see there are not. And this just makes it so that the build modifier has more to work with during the render. Um, it can make the render times a bit longer. And especially um, at first the animation was, you know, taking, you know, something like 15 seconds per frame. And then once I get all the way out to here, it started taking somewhere between a minute and two minutes at the end, towards the end, um, because it's just rendering so many vertices. So it wasn't the most ideal setup, but it did work really well. And so we have the build modifier here. I started at 48 and then it goes to, uh, 2048. And then, you know, I had finishing stuff at the end of the animation, which of course, once again, link at the bottom. Um, so that's the basic animation setup you can see here if I go in and put all these in it's a bit confusing so I've decided to separate it into layers I also have um, other layers of other objects here's the actual original constellation mesh that was created for me with uh, you know only edges in and then if we go over to this layer you'll see here's the actual original mesh that I had it kind of looks like a person to me now in hindsight but it actually I don't know what I was making I was just throwing stuff together in a kind of a weird shape and then this one is the actual original very first mesh that I created I used some modifiers to simplify it a little bit because it was a little bit more high poly originally and I did some you know just extruding I think I may have used some meta balls as well I can't remember at the moment but yeah so that's the basic um, animation setup here but I have more in this because I did the entire thing pretty much within this one blend file normally before this I had never experimented with using scenes inside of a blend file so I would have you know a final a post-process blend file a, a lot of blend files I just did not need now I have scenes, and I'm going to do a tutorial on this very soon, quick tips tutorial. I have scenes here. You can see I have three, in titles, final animation, and animation. Now my final animation is where I put together everything. So you can see here there's nothing in, the, uh, in any of the objects here. But if I go on over to Video Sequence Editor, and like that, you see it takes a bit to load. And I'm not going to be able to play this in real time because I'm recording. And you know these are all HD footages, and I haven't rendered a proxy out. But you can see here I have the... Um, the audio here and all the image sequence strips and that's really all that is in here oh yeah and one more thing if i go back to animation and i press uh play you can also see that um i think you should be able to hear let me check um no maybe you can't oh there we go yep there we go i think you should be able to hear let's check really quickly yeah so you you can see and this is my preview render that i did uh, using opengl render and you can check my channel because i have a tutorial on that um, but yeah, see, you see, I have the uh, audio here. So when I press Alt A, you should be able to, I, I can't hear it right now. I don't have my headphones in, but you should be able to hear the music. And so I could, you know, coordinate everything to the music accordingly. I got this music off of free, uh, freemusicarchive.org. Uh, and it's a really great site and you should check it out because there are a lot of fantastic artists out there. Um, I like using Kevin McLeod, uh, if that's how you pronounce his name. I'm sorry, I've never heard anyone else pronounce it. But um sometimes he gets a little overused and I like to use some other stuff from their site. But um, let's go ahead. So we've seen the animation, we've seen uh, you know, the final animation setup, which is really just the VSE and uh, any post. 
Um, and then we have in titles here. And now my in titles here at the end, yeah, this black plane, I did get a little lazy, guys, but uh, that's just the way it is. Now, if we see here, um, we can go ahead and go over here and play it. And um, right now, I don't have all of my things, so let me see. Where does this start? Um, and this is actually a really, really, really simple setup. Oh, whoop, there we go. Let's see. And end right there. I, I don't know, uh, in there somewhere here. Yeah, there we go. So if we go ahead and press play, you can see, uh, as you've probably seen in the video, these all come out and they look really organic and they kind of, you know, flop out and everything. And this was the look that I really wanted to achieve. Um, I think it kind of went with the video, not perfectly. I think I could have probably done a better in titles, but I did like this and I think it showed off um, that you can make some really organic looking stuff with Blender because I think a lot of people um, think that it really can't when actuality it can. Now these, um, this last little bit I'm going to talk about first because it's the easier bit. Um, don't worry about this black plane part. I just got lazy and there's a bunch of other ways I could do it. I don't want to show that because it's not my best work. It was trying to finish animation and get up on my channel. But um, so if we can see here, I play it and it's just, it's all like random. I actually did all that random by hand. I probably could have done it with a modifier or some kind of Python script. I was, you know, like I said, last minute, I was lazy, didn't want to bother scripting. I'm not very good at it either. And it, I kind of wanted it to have random, but I also wanted it to be kind of especially choreographed by my own hand. So I just did it by hand and it didn't take too long at all because uh, it's all done by materials. But yeah, I think it actually looks pretty good when it comes in, especially if we're watching it this fast. But um, so y'all are probably wondering, I think a lot of people, have, some people have messaged me about this and asked how I did these. Well, you can see here, if I'm going and clicking on them, there are a ton of modifiers. Now, don't get scared by this. It's actually simpler than it sounds, but uh, we'll take it step by step. So first off, we have the camera layer here, and um, then we have this. This is the empty layer. Now, this, you can see, it does most of them look like the letters that they portray. This is a uh, <laughs> this is basically the majority of the animation. And these uh, this layer is the animated only layer. Let me move this, or actually, let's just hide it for right now. Um, so yeah, um, the, these are actually really simple. So if we go ahead and see both of these and we press Z, you can see that these all actually have uh, the empties attached to them. And you're probably wondering what those are. These are hooks because if we watch it without these two modifiers on here, this subsurf and this simple deform, which we'll get to in a minute, you can see here that all this does is watch, comes down and then pulls the thing straight out. That's all it does is pull it straight out. Now you see sometimes when it updates, it doesn't update correctly, like stuff like that. Um, and it doesn't look, it doesn't work perfectly, but uh, you'll see here, all it does is come out straight like that. Then all I had to do to apply that first was I had a subsurf that is actually keyframed to apply only when this deform, deform modifier here. So we don't have to worry about that subsurf either. Um, and it's on optimal display. So we actually can't see it taking place right now. Now, if we uh, go ahead and look through this, you'll see here, if we, when we turn on this simple deform, it actually bends and the deform factor is influenced by something I keyframed myself and it kind of, you know, just wobbles up and down. And I, I did all the keyframing myself. I did not use sign functions. Probably should have done that. Would have made my time a lot easier. Wouldn't have to keyframe, you know, each individual of these um, bending ones. But I did like how it looked. And it turns out it's really simple. And um, it's just, it's just, it just works. So you can see here now, right now, if we go ahead and turn off the subsurf, you'll see why I added that subsurf. You can see here it's really rough edges because it's such a low poly shape because the actual extrusion doesn't need high poly but the, uh, the deform does. And so when we turn this up, you'll see this is what it looks like in the render, but I only have it for one for my view just to save some extra lag on my system. And so it's really just the same for every single one of these. Now, for the ones that curve like this, I wasn't gonna do deform. So what I did was I kind of cheated and you can kind of see it in the video and I kind of sad I cheated, but I basically just, uh, you know, did a bunch of points in here and then parent or hooked them to these empties and then kind of just manually keyframed the circle. I could have attached them to this curve here, but I didn't want to because the, the clamping was not really working as well as I thought it would. It was not as easy. And um, yeah, that's really it for the titles. It just goes down, you know, the A gets pulled down. And um, there's a lot of parenting structure involved here because, um, you know, these empties, this one right here can't just, uh, this one down here can't stay there the whole time. So it actually is attached to another one right up here. I'm pointing as the screen as if you can see it. I'm sorry if this is a little confusing. I will release the blend file, I believe, um, in a little bit, hopefully before I leave for the summer. And um, yeah, that's really about it. Um, these, are, of course, are the original ones without the text. Um, if you're wondering what font this used, I actually used a, a font called Polyline, um, I believe it's called, and you can get it on Da Font for free. Um, I didn't have to credit that because the license said it's only credited for commercials, so that's why it wasn't in the link to the video. But yeah, that's um, that's really about it. Um, I'll show you the final animation thing one more time in the video sequence editor. Um, really, the only thing I did here 
was at the and at least VSC wise was uh, I did overlay uh, these ones over here, which is why I can't run this part of it because it, it, VSC is terrible about running stuff slow. I also overlaid the constellations thing and um, Max Ebert, of course, here at the end, I volume I keyframe the volume to fade out. Um, yeah, see, and you can see how laggy that is right there. But um, what we also going to look at really quickly is the actual animation and how I did the rendering because that is really important. So you'll see here right now, literally all this is, is just a viewer so I can view it in the compositor. And I was going to do some compositing, but I decided no. And I also thought, well, maybe I would want to do um, some more compositing layer. Later, sorry, <laughs> layer. Um, so anyways, what I did was I actually did something really cool here. And um, I used OpenEXR multi-layer. Now you'll see it doesn't save here by default because I did another rendering later. But basically, I used OpenEXR multi-layer and warning if you have a long animation such as this one anything over like a thousand frames you're going to have large large package files unless you do um, some kind of compression although i did zip lossless because i wanted these to be perfect now open exr multi-layer is a really unique image format because not only does it save your original image it also saves an alpha channel of course it saves all your other passes that is done in a layer so uh, if we go ahead and look down here let me get this and pull this up you can see here all these passes such as Z, of course, speed, index objects, because that was really important to me. I was using a little bit of that in the compositing. And then emit values. All of these are actually saved inside of the file. So now we can go ahead and qu take a quick look at that. Let's go pull that up here. I have it in my temp folder. And let's see, constellations. Now, I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to show you something. And this is going to shock you. But yeah, this is 65.8 gigabytes of file size for something that's only about 2,500 frames long. So that's something you should definitely keep in mind. Now, once again, there are some repeat stuff in here, for instance, but the majority of these are actually not, or I guess the majority of them are EXRs. But yeah, every single one of these save an EXR. And so now also if we see, if we go into the node editor and we input an image, we're gonna go ahead and open one of those Im images right here now. Let's just do zero, zero, zero. It takes a second um, and you'll see here, it can, comes up with a bit more options than normal. There's this thing at the bottom and um, I'm not gonna do image sequence. I'm just gonna do single image. And you can see here composite and I also have render layer and when I click that you'll see it comes up with all of these here and so now I can actually view the um, the vector here hold on one second let's view this again put this back in here and you can see once again there's no vectors for frame zero um, uh, index obj once again we can't see anything emit values here um, our depth value which is going to be all white but we can go ahead and um, oh, we can't actually normalize that here and then the combined and so OpenEXR is actually incredibly helpful if your compositors or you have a separate compositor in somewhere else than your rendering. And also if you, uh, if you have a file, but you know, maybe it's a rush demand, like commercial thing, and they may need to change something last minute, the client, and you don't want to have, or you don't have time to re-render all that. The great thing is you can actually do so much in the compositor with all of your layers. So as long as you go ahead and save these in an EXR, you can save yourself a lot of rendering time and hopefully even the job that you're that is at stake. So um, that's about it. That's really all we're going to talk about today. I hope you enjoyed this first version of the Blender LP. I hope it wasn't too long, and I hope you all enjoy. Thank you so much for watching.